Salam Amra, thank you very much for, for joining us on the podcast today. Um, I want to start, I guess, by actually apologizing to you. We, we tried to record this a few days ago and we had technical issues. So uh, my apologies and, and thank you for being so accommodating and understanding. Um, I wanted to start actually just before we, we, we started recording, you mentioned um, that your book uh, was is a finalist in, in an award. Can you just uh, tell us quickly about that? Well, Salam to you and Rakshana. Um, I appreciate you inviting me to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and if we need to try again, we will do that. We will make it happen, but hopefully not. Um, yes, I just learned, um, in fact, uh, two days ago that my book, The Cat I Never Named, is the finalist for the most prestigious nonfiction award for young adults given by the American Library Association. Um, so that has been a huge news. Um, I am one of the five authors, or The Cat I Never Named is one of five books that is in the running. And um, of course, I would love to win um, the award. Um, Yalsa, it's called Yalsa Nonfiction Award, but I think j even just being a finalist is a huge uh, recognition uh, for the work I've done in the book. Um, and I'm particularly proud, and really it is meaningful to me deeply that I am I believe the only Muslim that has been a finalist in the history oh. of the award. Um, so that has been um, emotional for me um, when I heard. That's incredible. And and um, I think, you know, I wanted to start by discussing the kind of broader background and context of the book, um, because I think it's significant that unfortunately for whatever reason a lot of people and, and i speak specifically about muslims because that's obviously our our sort of remit and audience in our niche but a lot of people don't actually know um what took place in the early 90s um with the Srebrenica genocide and massacre and, and everything else so would you be able to i guess just from a historical perspective just present the context of which the book that you wrote exists and, and i guess also um, the, the structure, the fact that you wrote it as a, as a young girl, um, rather than reflecting back today, all of that kind of stuff. But just, I guess, uh, to start off with just giving us an understanding of the history of, of things. Of course. Well, you, you just pointed out that I wrote for young adults, and I specifically did it uh, for the initial reason that you had mentioned, which is that a lot of people don't know the story. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of young adults are thinking of genocide in the context of the World War II, sort of this distant time that can happen now. And so my book really was intended to be a reminder um, through simply telling my own story, what happened in Bosnia. And just to give you a little bit of history, um, former Yugoslavia is the country that I grew up in. And as a Muslim, I was born hated. Um, Muslims um, in Bosnia or the ethnic group of Muslims were called Bosniaks or are called Bosniaks. We were not even allowed to call ourselves Bosniaks. Um, I never, I grew up in a system in former Yugoslavia where I never read a book that had a Muslim child's name in it. I was a total nerd math, in math and physics and loved writing and reading, and I could never find a book with the main character who's Muslim. So the educational system in former Yugoslavia was built um, based on the intention to um, really make Muslims invisible. Um, and that's who we were for um, uh, many, many decades. And towards the end of 1980s, um, this narrative, ideal, ideology really of hatred towards um, non-white um, Christian Europe emerged in Serbia. Uh, one of the leaders, uh, whose name was Slobodan Milosevic, who is known as the Butcher, butcher of Balkans, um, he delivered this infamous speech in 1989, where he depicted and othered non-Orthodox um, Christians. Serbs were Orthodox Christians. Everybody else for him was the other. And um, a group that particularly stood out was the majority in Bosnia, and those were Bos Bosniaks or Bosnian Muslims. Um, so he began to really evoke this hatred and the emotions that were largely related and derived from the ideas of crusades. And he talked about the Ottoman Empire invading the Balkans and 
this ethnic impurity that came with the Ottomans, with the Turks into the Balkans. And I, as a teen growing up at the time, thought this was ridiculous because Bosnia and Herzegovina had one of the highest interfaith marriage rates um, known at that time. Um, the people were marrying uh, without thinking about the religious background. And I thought, well, it's not possible for someone who was, for instance, my uncle, who was a Serb who married into my mom's family, who was a high ranking officer in um, Yugoslav National Army. It's not possible for someone like that to one day be killing me. I am safe and we will be safe. And I was wrong. Um, I was wrong in, in a sense that I underestimated the extent to which narrative of othering and hatred towards Muslim can actually um, um, work and be extremely effective. And I think we see that in the United States um, today, we see that in the Western Europe today with Islamophobia as well. So by early 1990s, Serbia um, as a dominant Republic um, who controlled the military, the politics, the economics, led by Slobodan Milosevic, who I mentioned as the butcher of the Balkans, they essentially invaded. They first invaded Slovenia, which was also one of the formerly republics of Yugoslavia. By then, Slovenia was independent, by the way, and Croatia was also an independent country, as was Bosnia. Um, but the Yugoslav National Army uh, was uh, about 98% in terms of the officers served. So when Yugoslavia fell apart, the entire army, the arsenal, the artillery, basically was in the hands of Serbs. And so they, uh, they were very confident. They were very audacious and thought that they could invade all these other countries and ethnically cleanse them, because that's what Milosevic said has to happen. Um, and to assert their superiority, um, they invaded Slovenia. Um, it failed. Um, and then they invaded Croatia. They occupied about 30, 40% of Croatia's territory right along the, um, the border of uh, where I actually lived. I lived right on the border with Croatia, obviously on the Bosnian side. I was only five in a city called Bihać, only five miles from the border. And once they invaded Croatia, it became more real that things could go wrong in Bosnia. But, you know, we all are always uh, thinking that bad things won't happen to us. And I, as a 16-year-old, still, even with, with the wars in Slovenia and Croatia, thought, well, it can't happen in Bosnia. How are you going to divide a city or a country that is so um, intermixed? It's impossible. It's going to be brutal. And no one wants that. Um, but I think having military power gave Serbia confidence that they could do it. And so they, by the spring of 1992, they um, essentially occupied vast majority of Bosnia um, in the process of uh, Many Muslims, we're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, um, very quickly were put into rape camps, concentration camps. My city of Bihać um, was one of the few uh, that was not immediately um, overtaken by the Serb military. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. There would be no, the cat I never named, there would be no story to tell. And I went on to spend the next four years of my life, nearly four years, uh, living under a complete military siege, bombed um, daily, uh, starving with no electricity, no schooling in the midst of Europe in early 1990s. And for one reason only, because I was a Muslim. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating um, story and experience of what has happened to you and how resilient you've been. And you've, you've previously made comments and you've just talked about othering, uh, which you believe is happening in modern society. For the younger audience that might not be familiar with that term, what does othering actually mean? It's you know a largely term that I, in a way, I, I have invented through working in my own um, uh, so, sort of scholarly work and trying to relate what this, this how this visceral hatred um, becomes possible. And it becomes only possible if we are able to depict those who are external to us, those who we don't like, um, in, in, and couch it in some kind of ideological, religious, racial framework that others them, makes them 
makes us feel that they are so different than we are, that it is worthy to pursue some um, recourse that involves hatred and often uh, violence. And so I'm often asked, how can you be Muslim? You look white. You don't look like a Muslim. And the reason that I get that question is because Muslims have been racialized, right? They have been othered as this group that is not us, that is different than us, that we consider dangerous and um, um, a group that doesn't belong into the sort of modern, progressive, superior Western um, world. And that is the narrative of um, clearly white supremacy. But uh, outside of sort of the extreme fringes, an, an average individual in Western Europe, I think, and in the United States, um, does adopt that idea of Muslims are different and they don't belong. And that is the struggle that um, I clearly had gone through being Muslim in Bosnia and ultimately resulted in genocide. But I think it's a struggle that a lot of Muslims are going through in the Western world um, today, irrespective you, of, you, of their... You know what? So, sorry to cut you off, but what, what I think is really interesting is that there's this notion, especially in places like the UK, where you know the, the majority of the Muslim population is from a, a, an ethnic minority background, um, that you know one of the reasons why we are othered is because we look different um, and you know we wear the headscarf and and the skin color all that kind of stuff. But what I find really fascinating, I guess, about the situation in 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 Bosnia and the genocide that took place is that, like you said, you look European, you look like the like everybody else. But there was still this notion, and, and further on in the conversation, I do want to kind of talk about um, the present day situation and, and parallels and lessons that we can learn from the past. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, you could be one of them. But it's almost like there is this kind of inherent hatred of the other, whatever that's defined as, in this case, Islam or being Muslim, um, which is quite worrying. And, and when you, again, when you were speaking about uh, Slobodan Milosevic and the... Uh, the, the rhetoric and the kind of prevalent narratives that were taking place there, you know, we've seen a lot of that today as well in some way, shape or form. Um, but I think, like, <laughs> like you beautifully said as well, that you see things happen. So right now we look at France um, and the situation for Muslims in France is, is atrocious. It's horrendous. We're literally one little piece of water away from them. But we think, oh, that could never happen here. Like, fine, they've got the issues there, but we, we kind of in the UK, me and Rukshan are both in the UK, yeah. we don't, you know, we can't perceive a world where, where we're going to have issues like that to that extent where women can't wear a burkini, where we, women can't wear a headscarf inside public buildings, in schools and everything else. Um, but it's, it, this is the thing. There, though, the underlying tension is there. It might not be in force, yeah. but you know, we, you know, we do get, like, I took my daughter swimming the other day and someone said, why are you wearing, why are you fully covered? You look, you know. It's just, it's, it's, it's creeping in slowly, but but surely it might it might happen one day where we're being the same things are imposed amongst us as well, unfortunately. And and so so coming back to kind of the the, the context of history, um, where does where does your book kind of fit into all of that? Mm -hmm. You know the the exact point that you made a second ago that. I, by all the, all the measures that one could, could use to, to really determine whether I should have belonged to that, that society that I grew up in, I should have belonged, right? I didn't look different. I didn't pray. We were not religious. Um, I grew up in communism. Religion was to an extent banned. But at the same time, they were um, uh, there were elements of Christianity that were permissible and, and allowed, but I knew as a Muslim that I couldn't walk into a mosque and pray even if I wanted to, that uh, we had to be very, very careful. It was delivered to me through hidden curriculum in education with the lack of presence of anything that deals with Islam. I knew that I was not represented and I didn't belong and I had to grow up and be very careful about what I say and how I identify. Um, and in many ways, when, when one is marginalized in that sense, you attempt to do everything to fit in. So I was this perfect kid, perfect student. I played volleyball, 
I did all the things right and it still didn't matter. I still talk, for instance, in my book, and that is very important to me about examples of where and how I was discriminated by teachers, even though I was this perfect student. I was not troublemaker. I was not skipping classes. I was winning competitions, but I was still targeted by some Serb, uh, Serb um, teachers. And I think for me, there was a moment when I realized that it really didn't matter who I was. What mattered was how I was perceived, how I was described, how I was seen in that narrative of hatred, as uh, someone who does not belong and how I was othered. And so um, where does my book now come in and why I, um, I guess, wrote it particularly now to give you a parallel um, to, to our lives today, I do have two teen daughters who are both gifted, who skipped um, a grade in math in, in one of the top schools in New York City. And I am incredibly proud of that as a parent. And they um, uh, play sports and they do drama and they do everything right, right? So um, they are not, again, troublemakers, but they started to get questions and comments even from even in a place like New York City, so we're talking about very um, a cosmopolitan place with a lot of diversity um, uh, of different kinds. Um, and one day, my third grader came home. At the time, she was third grader, Dina, younger daughter. She came home and she said, "Mom, what will happen to Jana, her older sister, and me? If, uh, you and Dad are taken away, rounded up as Muslims. Will we be left alone?" And so. That was a result of the narrative, that political narrative that was happening in this country at, the moment, at that moment, but also clearly penetrated into the classrooms. Um, and um, that terrified me because that is when I recognized myself in her. And I recognized that moment, well, maybe something bad is going to happen. I don't think it could happen here, but maybe something will happen to me because of my background. And that is where my book really fits in because those kinds of conversations with my own children um, uh, compelled me to sit down and write the book because as a scholar at Columbia, I talk about these issues in theoretical terms, I'll use case studies and um, I never quite used my story um, in the way that I decided to do it now. And it is because I realized that really the most powerful way to move people and educate them is to tell them a story. What happens when you are hated to that extent? Well, what happens is you end up either dying in, um, in the midst of a genocide, or in my case, I was lucky enough um, uh, to survive it and, and tell the story. So um, in your book, obviously education, um, that was one of the big overriding themes. Um, and I kind of thought that, I felt that education was also a form of escapism for you. So although you had some, those sort of negative experiences um, uh, that had happened, I feel like at points when you needed, I don't know, some sort of comfort or normality, education was the way that you escaped. I mean, is that true to say? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. I think um, for me, it was also one thing that I could control. And that is something, um, that I often say, and I, in fact, at the beginning of this pandemic, I told my kids, they said, what will we do? There's no school and the world is falling apart. And I said, well, you can't change what's external to you. I couldn't stop genocide. I couldn't make people love me, accept me, stop hating me. There was nothing I could do, um, but I could do what was internal to me. And I decided that I would be the best person uh, or best version of myself, irrespective of how targeted and hated I was. And one way I felt I could do that was to focus on learning. So English, I learned on my own, uh, largely by using my dad's old dictionary from an attic um, uh, that I found in the midst of the war. And I said, I'm going to memorize every word of English. I can't pronounce it. Uh, but at least I'll know what it means and I'll be able to, to write it. And so if I didn't take those kinds of steps at that time, um, when I clearly didn't expect to even survive the war, but I, I wanted to engage in feeling good about myself and focusing on being a good human being and improving in some way, 
Um, but if I didn't take those steps, I wouldn't be here today. And, and so, yes, education was a form of escape for me, but also a form of humanizing myself um, in a way when, when others dehumanized me. I mean, there's a few, uh, sorry to interrupt you, there's, there's a few incidents that I, I mean, if you'd like to share them, uh, that I found quite interesting. Uh, when you got your first scholarship, uh, which was unfortunately sort of, in a way, taken away from you, um, and then how you actually ended up your end result scholarship, which made you uh, let, let you go into Columbia University. Could you briefly talk about that? Because it's, it's quite um, interesting. Sure. You know, one of the things that I tried to do with the cat I never named is to be really honest. And that also meant being honest about sort of the, the corruption or um, it, it, horrible things that happened during the war, uh, uh, even amongst those of us who were living in this besieged city, right? When uh, one is focused on primacy of survival, people try to take advantage of, of situations whenever they can. And so I um, allude in the book or, or tell the story of how um, I did end up winning uh, one of the math or physic, uh, math and physics competitions at the national level in the midst of the war. And in fact, I um, talk about it, how I was resistant to even participating in the competition because I didn't see the purpose um, of doing that in the midst of genocide. But um, I think it was an attempt of, I guess, our teachers and, and, and school leaders at the time to give us a sense of normalcy in some way. And I end up uh, winning some of the top awards. And as a result, I um, get the news that I was listed as, as one of the top students in the country at the time. Um, uh, and that I was placed on the list of 10 students who were worthy of saving in a way uh, by the war presidency um, of Bosnia at the time. And as a result, I get one of the first Bosnian passports ever issued. Um, and um, I am told that um, uh, my, my schooling will be paid for um, uh, through scholarship, um, to the extent that I can leave besieged Bihać. And so this gives me hope in the midst of um, everything that I was surviving at the time. But it turns out that um, that scholarship um, is taken by someone else. Um, I never really find out who took it, who used it, how, uh, but it disappeared. And obviously it was just one of the many depressing moments in the midst of the war. And then um, towards the end of the war, I, um, focused on helping doctors and nurses in my besieged city um, get vaccines to children who were at the front lines. And as part of that work, I encountered two child psychologists who came from the International Rescue Committee, which is a large NGO that works in conflict zones, um, who said, oh, do you, would you like to study in the United States? And I thought that, that was just a silly proposition uh, uh, because I didn't see how possibly I could survive. But I ended up giving them all of my original documents, my birth certificate, all my awards, transcripts, because they were worthless. I mean, in that, under those circumstances um, that we were in, especially in the last year of the war, we starved. Um, and uh, it didn't seem that Europe and the world cared. Um, UN was watching us getting killed every day and didn't do anything about it. And so I just thought that I would be dead anyway, but well, so why not at least try and give them my documentation? And I did. Um, and they um, managed through a number of steps to actually secure uh, through a philanthropist in the US a scholarship for me um, to come um, and study here. And so I was a semester late because the, I couldn't leave uh, and I didn't find out till the very end, towards the end of the war. Um, and I have to say that when I told my parents that I got a scholarship and I got that phone call um, in the clinic where I worked with the doctors, my parents actually thought that I went insane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, they thought that I had a nervous breakdown and um, they tried to calm me down and say, it's okay, we will be okay. And I said, no, it's real. I received a phone call through this enormous satellite phone that probably 
your list, your listeners, your audience has never seen. Um, and um, the only calls I would ever receive there were calls from UNICEF um, to say that that uh, a person in Croatia who would say, oh, there's a shipment of vaccines that's coming through. And when I picked up the phone and I was told that I am late uh, by a semester that I have a scholarship to study in the US, I actually hung up the first time. I, I thought it was, a, it was a prank call. And so my parents also thought that, <laughs> that I lost it. <laughs> you, you know, he hearing you um, reflecting back on, on I guess your your life and especially like you know your your early or mid teens and and the experiences you went through it's it's kind of surreal at least for me listening to this uh, when you're talking about oh you know the, the last part of the war and we were you you said at one point in passing we were starving um this is i think you know it's it's normal I, I, it's not normal but i mean it it's it's part of your history and your kind of experience but for 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 myself at least it's something that i can't even fathom or comprehend in terms of this being a part of somebody's life um and so you mentioned that you know because your because of your daughters you kind of decided to re-embark on um telling this story and, and 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 bringing that all up but what was the experience like for you in doing that because i can't imagine it's easy to revisit um trauma pretty much and 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 then i guess having conversations like this with us where you're then kind of reanalyzing the trauma that you've already brought up but what was the process like of kind of rediscovering that part of your life and then also on top of that getting into the mindset of your 16 year old self um and and writing it from that perspective because i can't imagine that has been an easy process for you you're absolutely right it, it was not easy um and and that is the reason why it took so long and so much um to really push me over the line to say, I'm, I'm ready to share my life in the most personal and genuine way. And mm -hmm. I have to say, when I uh, met with the publishers who were interested, Bloomsbury being the publisher of The Cat I Never Named, but I, in the process of, of deciding who to partner with on this book, I met with a number of other publishers. And what was always most important to me is that I could write the story the way it happened. And so it was important to actually write it in the voice of a young adult um, and reflect on all of the thinking and, 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 and emotions that I went through um, at that time. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I was scared. Um, I was really terrified because I didn't know how I would react once I was in it fully for an extended period of time. Um, and I did have um, a lot of nightmares when I started writing specifically around certain chapters. I, I could probably tell you the pages that were written through tears. I remember um, reading it and I actually was, um, I don't normally get quite emotional when I read books first on account, but I did find myself actually crying because I, I, I could feel every, you were talking about it now, sorry. Every, I could feel every word that you were, that you were saying about and there's just constant fear of just the sexual violence that you went through i mean even the beginning of your book i mean it captures you straight away because that's what you kind of begin with really that omniscient sort of presence of, of, of it in background that's correct that that opening to the book is a moment when i actually come back um and, and i think also reflects on on the innocence that we had, my parents had, and the entire country had about that this couldn't happen to us. I think Salim, what you said, you're listening to me talking about starvation and killing and, 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 and that is not something that should be normalized. And it certainly wasn't normalized for me mm -hmm. as a 16 year old, but in the opening to the book, I am um, on the train returning from visiting um, a, a relative in Belgrade, Serbia. So this is a train that um, I was on for hours. Um, and the reason I was sent uh, there by my parents who believed in education uh, very much so um, was because I was selected to do um, some sort of um, IQ testing um, uh, based on some standardized tests that we were doing at that time uh, or before the war in, in the city, in, the, in my city. And so I was sent to this sort of highest level of testing in Belgrade um, at the time. And 
on the train back, I encounter the Serb nationalists uh, and, and their soldiers who um, were the ones who led the most um, horrific um, kinds of executions and, and, and engaged in rapes and, and whatnot during the war. And they're referred to as Chetniks. Um, and I find myself on the train as a 16 year old Muslim girl for the first time traveling on the train by myself. The only reason my parents would have allowed me to do that is because they knew this test would be important and they didn't expect the war in the same way that I didn't. Um, and I, and I, um, I won't go into details, but it becomes very obvious that I, if they knew I were a Muslim, they would have, could have um, raped me at the time. And that is the moment that wakes me up. Um, but a moment that I never shared uh, with uh, my parents. In fact, the only time I shared it with my mother, who is still alive uh, and who lives with me, is when I was writing the book. Uh, so that if the book is translated in Bosnian, that she's aware of some of these moments. And it, it, in a way, gets to Celine your questions question about difficulty of writing about this. Mm -hmm. There are stories in the book that I share for the very first time. Um, if you if you don't mind uh, me asking, just quickly, what was your mother's reaction or response when you told her all these years later about that incident? A lot of tears, mm -hmm. a lot of tears, um, a lot of tears, because uh, through this writing process, even in talking to my brother, uh, younger brother, it became obvious that we all hid stories from each other and not hid with the intent that we didn't want to be honest because it's more than obvious that my family was an extremely loving family and yeah. that is something that every reader falls in love with, um, mm -hmm. with members of my family. But we loved each other so much that we couldn't inflict additional pain by sharing our own pain. And I think that is something that happens in trauma that we, when we love those around us, we try to absorb so much of it and hide it within ourselves. And that becomes a huge burden to carry. And really to answer your question, in a way, writing the story has allowed me to unleash that burden, to share that burden with the world and say, look, this is extremely painful and I'm gonna put myself out there. I've made myself vulnerable, but I've also made other people vulnerable in a sense that they're realizing if let's say they have a tendency to hate or other Muslims or, or, or other, some other group on whatever basis, they can recognize now how much pain that can inflict on mm -hmm. someone by reading uh, my story and, and connecting to it. And I do have to say, I have received emails from people I never expected to, to receive emails from who have said, um, I'm sorry for what happened to you and I connect with you. And I knew nothing about Bosnia. I knew nothing about the genocide, um, but I'm grateful that you share the story. And that was, that is something that is very important to me and that, that, I, um, that I find to be a part of healing, that people are connecting to the story. I found that your book, um, you, obviously, it's, it's a cathartic process, isn't it? I think from the impression of me as a reader, I felt like I was kind of, although I couldn't physically join you in that journey that you, you know, suffered and you survived, uh, your words, because they're so, empower so empowering, I feel like I'm going on that journey journey with you and I feel like that's probably from what you said that was your that was your aim and I'm assuming that that's how you manage to deal with daily life um by just kind of having that really strong ethos and I guess not talking about it with your parents was a way to help them sort of survive so to speak because obviously no one wants to hear those things you know that, that their child is going through I guess and and how sorry if I can just kind of add on to that throughout all of this I would if only Ruxan I was going to Ruxan I was going to use the exact same word it, it seems like it was quite a cathartic thing but at the same time there's a, a, an immense amount of bravery I think that goes with it like you mentioned you know being able to be that vulnerable and I guess also knowing at the same time that there's hundreds if not um, more 
people that have have very similar experiences and and that have similar stories to tell but you've obviously got the opportunity and the platform to tell your story but still it's you exposing yourself to the world which is you know nobody um wants to necessarily put themselves in that position um but how 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 do you think that you manage to remain resilient um, and I think that's when when we first spoke, I think it was probably about six, seven weeks ago. I, I remember leaving that phone call and the kind of overwhelming uh, emotion for myself was this like element of resilience that you're giving off. Like despite the fact that you've been through all of this and even, you know, the way you talk about it as like, you know, this is your lived experience, but now you're here and you're in the present and you've, you've, you've gone through that and you're, you've been strong enough to write a book. But how have you kind of maintained that? How did you do that at the time, but also throughout all these years? Mm hmm. You know, there are certainly moments when, when I'm, I'll be honest, when I break down and I just cry. Um, those days that I have, for instance, when I learned about the award that um, my book is one of the deemed one of the top five nonfiction books in the United States as someone whose English is second language, who is a genocide survivor, who is a first generation immigrant, who is that other. Um, and realizing that there's so much pain on the pages of, of that book, that that pain in a way earned me recognition. Mm -hmm. um, it was extremely emotional and um, I couldn't respond to calls and emails for a good hour. Um, I sobbed, um, I sobbed, I, I walked into a room, closed the door in my house and um, simply cried uh, for an hour, just thinking about um, the fact that this was a release of my pain in a way, this was not the book for me. This is a voice I never had. My mouth was taped and my, my hands were tied figuratively for much of that life. And the world didn't hear me. The world didn't see me. The world didn't care if I'm dead alive, if I'm raped or not, it didn't matter. Um, but now the world sees me in a way and not only me, but through me sees thousands. So I've, um, you know, I was not just to give you an example. I, I was not on social media active at all till this pandemic. And it's only when the book came out in September that I set up a public Facebook and Twitter account and Instagram, just in case people reach out to me. And I didn't think about the awards. I didn't think about recognition. I didn't think about media publicity. Um, but just thought that, well, maybe some Bosnians will reach out to me when, when they read the story, who are refugees around the world. Um, I have received tens of thousands of messages of letters where people start with their date of birth and say who they are and what they had gone through. And that emotional outpouring that's directed at me as this one person that they are now seeing as the channel mm -hmm. to tell the story of who they are and they're identifying with me has been overwhelming in emotionally, but has also given me a sense of responsibility in a sense that I can't fail these people. These are the survivors who are telling now stories of those in their family who were raped or those who were killed. I can't fail in telling our story. I'm responsible in a way for that. And I think that sense of that there is someone you feel responsible for um, gives you a sense of resilience and, and helps build that resilience. And you know, people think resilience means we are not vulnerable. I don't think that. I think resilience means not giving up when you when the life tempts you to give up. So just I've said to myself every day of the war, give up tomorrow, don't give up today. And I do that um, today, whenever I face something difficult, I say, look, think about giving up tomorrow, don't give up today, because there are people who are looking to you um, to help them in one way or another. And I felt that way during the war, my family, my brother. Um, so I think that's part of the kind of resilience at work, if you will. Uh, but the other part is also love that I had in my life. I have been lucky. I have a great family and I'm deeply grateful for it. Now I have a husband who understands if I have a nightmare and, you know, for the first few years of our marriage, I, you know, I was waking him up a lot and, and he still loves me. So that's a good sign. <laughs> um, 
throughout the book, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, but if you, uh, what were you going to say? Sorry, my apologies. Oh, I was just going to say that um, that during the war, and I think that will be a surprise to um, the readers of The Cat I Never Named, while there's a lot of pain, there's also a lot of love. Um, and um, love that I encounter um, for the first time. For instance, I fall in love as a, as a teen in the war because I decided, well, I, if I'm going to die, I may as well throw myself into yeah. uh, loving someone for the first time. And I experienced that first love during the war. Um, and also family love and support was uh, fundamentally important um, for me to get through in those days, through everything that we were going through. In yeah, those I mean, uh, you've touched upon sort of a lot of the harrowing experiences, but I also found that it was kind of often juxtaposed with with love, with friendship, um, you know, and there was, you know, even when you're describing things that had happened in the atmosphere of going through bomb blasts and explosions, there's a, there's almost a kind of beauty with the way the things fall, like your words are very poetic, even at a time when it's quite dangerous and 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 violent. And so I think you, there is a lot of softness in your book as well as well, I think. And I did find the the relationship interesting with um with with I don't know your boyfriend or your or your first uh, sort of encounter in a romantic relationship. But also in regards to uh, Matsy the cat who offers you a lot of uh, love and comfort. Um and I think the book is really the title itself is very is very interesting. So what what was the significance of the title the cat I never never named and you've sort of referred to the cat saving you uh, and what why do you think that is you know I wanted to communicate that in the book um, when it comes to Mati and I'll just um, give a little bit of a context so my father and I find ourselves in the midst of all of these refugees coming into our city they're escaping because um, people are already getting killed outside of my hometown and <clears throat> My dad and I encounter Matsi. Matsi means kitty um, in Bosnian. And this cat um, follows us home, refuses to leave, even though my mom uh, was then and is still this person who didn't likes everything tidy and, and neat and doesn't like hair, animal hair. Um, and uh, we didn't have food. Uh, we didn't have food for ourselves, let alone to now be responsible for another living being. We didn't know what will happen to us. So nobody wanted cat. And I was a kid who was afraid of anything with claws. I was attacked by my uncle's actually German shepherd when I was younger. And so no one wanted her, but she didn't care um, that she was unwanted. She wanted to give love and she gave us love even when we said, we're not interested. Then my mom would make me close the door and say, you can't let her in. And she would just sit there kind of with her paws, knock at the windows, <laughs> wouldn't let go. Um, and eventually she finds her way in. Uh, but what becomes powerful, and uh, in a way, I only processed these, these relationships now as I was writing the book, because I never took the time. I focused on doing well in school, getting a job, and doing all these things to succeed and survive um, in the United States as a first-generation immigrant. So I never really took the time to reflect back um, on, on my life, and particularly on Matsu. And what I realized is that we actually never named her. We never honored her with the name, even though she became this source of love that I couldn't get even from humans um, in, in some ways. And um, as, um, as you said, Rakshana, she, in fact, on the very first day of bombing of my city, June 12th, 1992, uh, my brother and I, my younger brother, Dina, and I survived um, a bombing where four of our friends were blown up um, only because we were looking for Matsi and she didn't come out to meet us where four of our friends were standing. Instead, we went to look for her, went in two different directions and we lived. So my story, the cat I never named would not have been written. My life would not have happened. Um, I would have been a statistic um, if it were not for this Mati that we didn't want. And in many ways, she parallels right, the immigrants that we don't want. Um, as an example, I'm going to use something that's very relevant to all of us today. Um, 
two Turkish um, immigrants to Germany. Um, historically, we know Germany has not welcomed immigrants. I have many family members um, who live in Germany who are our second, third generation and who still um, experience bias and discrimination. But here we are, the world may be saved by the medical uh, discoveries and scientific progress produced by two Turkish immigrants to Germany. Mm. And so Mazi in a way parallels um, or is a symbol of that unwanted person who wants to be part of your society, give you love, contribute, be productive, but you don't want. And in my case, I realized that I'm alive, not only in that first instance, but in many other instances that happen in the book, in part um, because of that um, living being that I never named. Yeah. I, I think there was, the, I mean, you just now were referring to the, the, the couple that um, were at the forefront of discovering the, the vaccine for COVID-19. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting as well that you were talking just now about surviving um, and, and that was the, the kind of overwhelming kind of thing that I was thinking just now as you were speaking, that so many of us, um, I say us, but like for, I, I reflect on like my dad's journey. So my, my family's from Uganda. So Idi Amin um, kicked out all of the Asians from Uganda at one, at one moment. And the whole journey of a lot of groups of, of, of migrants, refugees, whatever, the, whatever they might be, um, is the story and the narrative is always about survival um and what's really interesting is that people never stop and like it's it's only when we kind of sit down as a family when everyone's around um and the stories start coming out from back in the day and how they used to live and work and whatever and there's so many lessons to kind of unpack there and there's so much to learn from the experiences and just like you said the fact that you kind of put your story out there um the the outpour of responses that you've had because there are so many people who have had similar experiences and, and resonate with with what you have have been through and lived through and 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 it's i guess it's a credit to yourself um that that you've you've been able to to kind of put this together um and and the impact that it's had and you know inshallah more and more success for the book in the future but just kind of to to close out i wanted to just briefly discuss um more looking at the kind of current political climate um, and your thoughts because we've had in fact we've had a podcast it was some years ago in our old office I, I think about two years ago roughly where we we actually discussed whether we're facing or whether there is potential for us to face a, a 21st century Muslim genocide um, and, and and the guest that we had on basically said that yeah you know what it looks like we're, we, we could be heading in that direction because of the demonization um, the other ring, you know, all all of the things that that we've seen, and there is like a there's like the eight stages of, I think of genocide, if I'm not mistaken, and there's like these classification, all these different things, and we've seen elements of these take place in the UK, in the US, in France, in particular as well. Um, but I guess the question to yourself is, you know, do you see there being that possibility? Firstly, and if if yes, then how can we prevent that? What what steps can we take, or should we take at this moment in time at the end of 2020 to ensure this doesn't happen? Based on my experience, I've learned that everything is possible. There's nothing that is impossible. And I started my academic career teaching statistics and, and probability theory courses. So uh, probability of an event happening is, in my view, when it comes to, to hatred um, uh, being a driving force, never a zero. And so um, I think we have to remain vigilant and we can't, um, we can't ever um, uh, allow the narrative of hatred to be normalized and we have to speak out against it. And um, I, I do, for instance, get uh, threats um, in addition to overwhelming positive reaction by hundreds of thousands of people who have reached out or commented or sent something on social media, um, I do also get those who uh, would wish for, for me not to exist and who use the language that I didn't know exists um, a, to depict me as a person who speaks on these issues. Um, so 
this hatred is real. It's out there in the United States um, with the um, election. We've seen that still more than 70 million people uh, voted for um, a president who really use this narrative that othered muslims he can i ask a quick question on that so so when when donald trump said i think islam hates us um that that was i think one of his most famous um islamophobic lines although there are quite a long list but in particular when, when you heard that what was what went through your head because you've seen this narrative before you know what went through my head is that the target from my back has never left me that I will live my entire life with a target on my back and that I need to take action and that I need to speak out against it, um, that I do need to be now as someone who has a platform and has a voice um, and who's being heard and seen, that I need to be that example where people will actually look at me and say, wait, wait a second, but as you noted, you look European or you look like us and we should, how, how come we are othering you? Why? And then it, our conversation usually begins on this idea that hatred is really what creates that perception of the other, uh, where we need to get to know each other. You need to get to know me first before you say that you other me or you hate me and realize that there's so much more in common that we have uh, than not. And so my hope is to evoke that collective empathy. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to have honest conversations with ourselves. Um, and uh, we need to encourage more meaningful stories of survival, of resilience, of struggle, of genocide, and of how hatred and racism of all kinds can impact lives and destroy lives and eradicate groups of people. We need to have those honest conversations and remind ourselves that those, all those kinds of crimes against humanity or individual rights are a possibility. Um, and um, the cat I never named for me is one of those um, uh, efforts, if you will, to provide, a con to provide content for a conversation in the classroom and within the groups of people who never heard of genocide against Muslims so that they can realize where Islamophobia takes a society. Uh, when, when I was reading the book, um, I, I mean, I have a, a little bit of understanding beforehand about the Bosnia genocide and the history. I was actually drawing parallels with uh, the 2017 genocide of Rohingya Muslims. Um, so it, although, I mean, what happened was, to you was not that long ago. It was the 1990s. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't hundreds of years ago. It was very, very recent. So there is that kind of threat. And you mentioned earlier on about how the UN and in your book several times, I, um, I don't want to give too much away because it's so that people can read it and find out more, but how do you feel about the organisation compared to when you were younger and going through all those experiences and, and now? Um, that's a complicated question. Um, I certainly do think that we should have these multilateral organizations that bring us closer together. Um, but I did during the war uh, uh, realize it became very, very clear that um, the UN, um, the world, Europe, the United States, the West were not going to take the action. And in fact, in my next book, or there are two books that I'm working on, one of them is going to address how Bosnia has become um, this sort of place where all these forces, political tensions play out in this tiny little country, um, the world, sort of the West and the East meet and Islam and Christianity meet. And so there are all these proxy interests um, that have led to uh, really uh, Bosnia being a source of radicalization after the war. On one hand, those who say they radicalize in the name of Islam will use Bosnian genocide as a justification for, for their radicalization. And on the other hand, um, an increasing number of white supremacists are actually flocking to the region and using this genocide against Muslims as an example that you can affect, actually you affect can do it. Yeah. You can do it. It can happen. Um, 
So uh, I do think that we do need multilateral organizations, but I think also the West, Western world, ideologically, when I say Western world, needs to come to terms with its own Islamophobia and the lack of um, incentive, if you will, to counter genocide when genocide involves Muslim population. Because I do think that if um, it were not, if Bosnians, uh, Bosniaks were not Muslim, I think that uh, likely the intervention would have happened earlier because there would have been that commonality. But because Muslims are other than Europe, um, it took longer, um, I think, to come to um, realization that something had to be done um, to end the war. And so I will be examining um, those kinds of tensions in one of the two books that I intend to write next. Um, and and one of them will be a sequel um, to The Cat I Never Named, uh, bookended. Because I feel like there's more. I was like, what happens next when she goes to America? How does she you know, form her own sort of family? So I'm glad you said there's a, se there's a sequel. I feel yeah, the like sequel, the sequel I'll, I'll tell you this, um, I'll reveal this detail. The sequel is going to be um, bookended with obviously the end of genocide, me coming to the United States, and then me experiencing September 11th uh, while I was working. Um, and uh, in fact, that morning I was supposed to be on the plane, not on one of those planes, but on a plane. And so that sort of, again, captures the experience of being Muslim and being othered mm -hmm. and how that uh, brought back the memories of what happened during the genocide. And just, um, I guess, finally, in terms of thinking about um the where we are today i feel personally like counter narratives are important so for example you presenting your own personal narrative on things humanizing the muslim experience throughout the genocide humanizing the experience of of victims of the genocide i think is is crucial um but at the same time i think there is a need and you were talking just now about the fact that if the bosniaks weren't muslim the intervention would have taken place sooner but for me, that says that as, as a Muslim community in the West, there is a, a, a very severe and desperate need for us to grow our strength and, and empower our own voices. And that's through kind of political lobbying, academia, media, everything basically to, to, um, to secure our kind of position as human beings, if, if that makes sense. Because otherwise people are willing to strip us of our rights and it's not a stretch to kind of say this and speak in the way that I am because it's it's happened to yourself and to to Muslims like like uh, Rukshana mentioned the Rohingya Muslims as well. It's a it seems to be a theme that is is recurring, um, and I think a big part of that is because Muslim lives are unfortunately fundamentally seen as being expendable or lesser. Um, do you think that's that's too far to say that, or do, you know, are you inclined to kind of agree with that sentiment? I agree, um, actually, entirely with what you just said. I do think that um, one of the reasons why I feel compelled to speak up is because I do think that uh, Muslim voices are marginalized in political life, in education, in um, um, any sphere, domain of life. And so um, we do need to raise awareness of how it feels to be a Muslim in many of these societies where Muslims are second-class citizens, irrespective of what sort of individual success we, we may, some of us may, may achieve. I think there is that awareness that uh, so many members of the Muslim community are othered, are starting with children who are bullied in schools. And we know those incidences are, are prevalent. There's research out there that confirms that Muslims are the least desirable neighbors in uh, Europe, um, in the United States, even though if we look at the terrorist attacks over the last decade, 70% um, have been uh, uh, have been driven by white supremacy, not by Muslims wanting to establish a caliphate, but still Muslims are that one group that is really identified with terrorism, violence, mm -hmm. and, and, and being less worth, uh, worth somehow as human beings. And so I do agree that we do need to activate ourselves. We need to, and my hope is to catalyze others. I can't do the work by myself. The two of you can't do the work by yourself, but 
talking about these issues hopefully will catalyze others to, in my case with the cat I never named, to read my story and maybe start the conversation in their classrooms, with their friends, in their communities, to, um, to make everyone aware of what it means to be a Muslim and what it means to be a genocide survivor. And um, so, yes, I do hope that we can, through conversations like this, compel others yeah. to take action at all levels. And there's always something that someone can do. If I could learn English and if I could do uh, certain things to improve myself in the midst of genocide in the war, I'm a big believer that we can be looking for excuses why we don't take action. Um, and action, in my view, is always a non violent form of action. In other words, you counter violence with pen, you counter violence or discrimination by speaking out, uh, by having conversations, writing books, teaching, uh, politically running for office, whatever form um, of activism one, uh, one sees possible within their reach. That, that, that's a whole other conversation to be had, which I think we're not going to pick up on. But I think, you know, the, the one takeaway, like you mentioned, if you could do it in, um, in, in Bosnia in a kind of a war-torn setting, I think the, if, if anyone is looking for some sort of inspiration, they should just, at the base level, pick up a dictionary and try and memorize every word like you did. And that could be the foundation for something incredible, right? Um, who knows what, what could kind of come from that. Um, but Amra, I, I wanted to, to thank you um, very much for, for, for sharing your time with us and, and sharing your insights into your experiences and the book and everything else. Uh, really, really appreciate it. It's been very insightful um, and, and loads to, I think, take away from. Um, so thank you very much and, and, and all the best for the awards as well. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you for inviting me. This was um, a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it because we took the time to really um, dig deeper into some of these topics that are important. And um, I want to encourage all of your audiences to, to take action and do something to counter bias, to counter discrimination of all forms, not only anti-Muslim racism and, and bias and Islamophobia, but um, to, to become better people um, in their communities and um, those around them. I think that is really what will for sure uh, give Muslims um, a larger platform and, and voice in our societies. Um, uh, we need to humanize ourselves and, and show what we can do to contribute productively in every society that we live in. So I appreciate you giving me the platform and having this conversation with me. And I do hope we meet in person one day. Inshallah. Thank you very much. You're a fascinating person, and I really hope that the listeners do, you know, pick up the book and uh, and read it because there's there's so many more layers uh, we could go into, but um, I don't want to give it all away. You know, <laughs> I want people to pick it up and, and read it. It's really a, uh, it's really interesting. The war didn't spring on me all at once. Instead, like a cat, it stalked me quietly. There might have been a rustle of leaves, a glint of golden eye, but like a mouse, I didn't believe it was there until it pounced. 1992, chapter one. Math, puzzles, logic, ciphers. My brain is still whirling from the battery of tests as I ride the train from Belgrade, Serbia, back home to Bihać, Bosnia. The tracks push westward, the setting sun gilding the hillsides. Families, mothers, children, patter and laugh, scold and squeal in a comfortable cacophony that lets me almost doze off. I'm sleepy from a long day of tests, and I'll be lucky to get home by 1 a.m. A few stops later, the families get off, soldiers get on, and I realize with a sinking feeling that I will be lucky to get home at all. I lower my eyes at once as men stomp down the aisles. I don't have to look to know they're Chetniks, the most vehement Serbian nationalists. They're dressed in black with weird tall hats. The men have beards, wild hair, and hate in their eyes for anyone who is not Serb. I saw them all over the streets of Belgrade, sneering and shouting at anyone they thought might be Muslim. Quoting Slobodan Milosevic's hateful speeches. Aren't you afraid? I'd asked my cousin Jana. It's not a big deal, she replied with an indifferent shrug. People feel like they can just say anything these days. 
But when these soldiers invade my train, I feel that they'll have far more than words for this lone teenage Muslim girl. Within seconds, the stench of them fills the train car. It's aggressively masculine and rank, sweat, liquor, grease, and gunpowder. They jangle like marchers in a macabre parade as their belts and bandoliers full of a mission's clan. Did you hear the way he begged for his life, one barks? The Croatians, they're not real men, their commander says, but they're women. The first one leers, black-eyed angels. Nothing to compare with Balia women, though, a soldier says. Balia is an insulting word for Muslims. I've heard they are like rabbits, eager and soft. The commander cuffs him on the head and he reels drunkenly. You don't fall in love with, with them, you idiot. You put syrup seed in their bellies. He grabs the soldier by the collar. You wipe them out, generation by generation. You dilute their unclean blood. You honor them with half Serb babies. And one day, they will be gone from this earth and only Serbs will remain. Another Chetnik chuckles menacingly. I don't think they realize they're being honored. One eye had screamed so loud. The conversation is lost as they head to the back of the train. I tuck up my knees, curling myself as small as possible as I fix my eyes out the window. I want to run off this train, but would that be any better? I'm still in a Serb controlled region. At least now I'm heading home. I can't decide and then it's too late. The train is moving again. My parents are such fools, I rage inwardly. Anger feels better than the stark terror that is my only alternative, but I can't keep it up. My parents are naive, good, hopeful, innocent. They fervently believe that humankind is fundamentally good. To them, wars are mistakes. Violence, just a blip on the road to universal humanity. Sure, it has happened before, but they believe in their inmost hearts that any day now, the world will come to its senses and be the peaceful, philosophical, intelligent place it was meant to be. They're sure the world can care for their children. They believe the education is the key to creating that utopia. To that end, I recently took a bunch of tests in my hometown, math, logic, world puzzles, general knowledge. The results surprised even me. I have a friend whose mother works in the Bureau of Statistics. Who is that? Who is this Amr girl? The mother asked her. She got 100% on some of these tests. No one has done that in her generation. I was proud, my, but my parents were giddy. You can do anything, Amr, they told me. Just follow through, never give up on your education. No matter what happens, it is the most important thing. That's why they put me on a train to Belgrade in the heart of Serbia. It was the only place to take the next and highest level of tests. It was also a place where the majority of citizens would hate me if only they knew what I was. Or the, the Serbs are in the outright war with the Croatians. Croatians want independence. Serbs want land and control. I don't know if the Serbs actually hate the Croatians. Soon the Serbs will be coming for Bosnia. And there is no doubt at all how the Serbs feel about Bosnian Muslims, Bosniaks. They hate us. They think we are subhuman. Months ago, their leader, Radovan Karadzic, already threatened we would be eradicated. In a speech in parliament, he said we were going to hell if Bosnia leaves Serb-dominated Yugoslavia. If these soldiers have done such horrific things in Croatia, what will they do in Bosnia?